songs to keep themselves happy. And as they approached the northmost mountains where the witch resided, the girl looked at the star and asked, is there anything I should or need to know about the witch? And the star said, well I know a story about her. Would you like to hear that? And of course our girl wanted to hear a story. And so the star began to tell a tale, a tale of the witch and how she tricked the great god Sky. It starts with the great god of the sky's wife, the goddess of kindness, the goddess of love. She was the opposite to her husband. But it seemed that fate saw that that opposite should put them together. And they loved each other very deeply. They did. But immortality means eternity. And eternity is a really long time. For those of you who haven't thought of that already. <laughs> and so, the great god of the sky grew weary of his marriage to the goddess of kindness and love. And his eyes started to wander. And those eyes were followed by feet. And those feet were followed by his body. Whenever or if the goddess of kindness and love took even a shine to someone he forbade it. But that could not stop her falling in love. There was someone who she loved so much. And she loved to watch the sun rise in her eyes. But it could not be. Now one day, the great god of the sky saw his wife drinking from a bottle of wine. 
And this bottle of wine had a scent which drifted over to his nose, and he inhaled those sweet, sweet smells, and he thought, wow, it smells amazing. Can I have some? He asked. And his wife said, it doesn't work like that. You need to go and get your own. This is my wine. It was given to me by some. And the great god of the sky thought, okay, I can go and find it. And she explained that it was given to her by the witch, the Northmost Mountain. Now you see, in the Northmost Mountains, two peaks fall down to create a valley. And in the middle of this valley is a hill which rises up, and at its peak is a castle. And from that castle flow four waterfalls. <coughs> which spread their fingers out into vineyards. And those vineyards go grow grapes. And those grapes produce the finest wine you could ever drink. The castle is owned and lived in by a witch. Its shelves are filled with bottles of the wine. <coughs> and this is the castle, the great god of the sky, came from his heavens to visit. He found himself at the foot of the hill. The winding staircase went past those waterfalls and he strolled up. Now he heard about this witch. He heard she was pretty cool. Now some witches, like all black, ah, they can be quite grumpy. But that is not all witches. <coughs> Some witches love colour. <laughs> now our witch had dark hair. But that was about it. She had bright green eyes. And she had a shimmering, shifting, multicoloured dress. Which changed colours with the breeze. And she was pretty cool. <laughs> As the great god of the sky made his way up those winding steps, he saw an old beggar lady. Who somehow was a little familiar to him. But that didn't really bother him. She was being very slow, so he did what he should do and pushed her out of the way. <laughs> and he made his way up to her doorway, knocked on the door three times. It opened of its own volition, and there she was, dark hair, green eyes, shimmering, effervescent dress, changing colours. Yeah, he thought she's pretty cool. She looked at him. And he said, Good witch, would you give me a bottle of your finest wine? <laughs> the witch looked back at him and said, That is not how it works. Come back tomorrow. And the old beggar lady had remarkably caught him up. Very strange. And she said, Oh, kind witch. <laughs> Could you perhaps give me a bottle of your lovely wine for my sister? She's not very well. And the great uh, witch said, of course. Clicked her fingers, and in the old beggar lady's hand was a bottle of the finest wine. She said, <laughs> bye-bye, and sped off, back down the stairs. The great god of the sky thought, ah, I understand how I'll solve this. But he took himself away overnight, and overnight, everything changed. You see, the great god of the sky transformed himself into the most handsome man you could possibly imagine. Think Tom Hardy, crossed with Idris Elba, crossed with Viggo Mortensen playing Aragorn, or whatever you want to imagine, it's for you. He was a man, and he found himself at the foot of those stairs. And he started to stroll up. He felt pretty good. His muscles rippled. His ripples muscled. I don't know what that means, but it happened. And he saw the old beggar lady. And she thought, Ooh, that's a man. Out of the way, old beggar lady. I'm a man. And he strolled up. He got to the door of the witch. He didn't knock. He just cast it over. And there she was. She was pretty cool. But she looked at him and thought, Ooh. Close to her. And there was no time for talk. Their eyes locked. 
then their lips locked. And she took his lips and did her will with them. She passed them over her neck and further down over her breasts and further down still. And ooh, she did not expect him to be quite so good at kissing <laughs> down there. <laughs> And then she took him to her bed. And they played out pleasure upon pleasure upon pleasure upon pleasure. You would have been tired just watching. It was incredible. A beat. It was quite literally divine. And eventually, when it ended, she rolled off him, sweat and breath rasping from her chest. And he looked with her with eyes made actually emotions. <laughs> I would say, would you give me a bottle of your finest wine? She looked back in and smiled and said, still not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Try again tomorrow. <laughs> and the old beggar lady had made her way up and seen things that an old beggar lady should never have to see. <laughs> said, Possibly trouble you for a uh, another bottle of my brother, who's also very, very unwell. <laughs> of course, your brother, anything. Which clicked her fingers in the old beggar lady's hands it was a bottle of finest wine. Thank you very much. She said, Bye bye. Off she sped, quicker than the time before, probably to get away. <laughs> the great god of the sky was the uterus. He stood up, completely naked. Not realising how silly and ridiculous he looked, but he looked her in the eye and said, I am the great god of the sky. I am lord of the cosmos and I could kill you where you stand if you do not give me a bottle of that wine now. the whole two things he knew what to do. <laughs> Sex and violence. <laughs> he was a man, what else was he to do? <laughs> and then he thought, oh, yes. He looked at her and said, could I have a bottle for my wife? Of course, said the witch, why didn't you ask? <laughs> bottle in his hands. But if you drink a single drop of that before she does, you must give her a boot of her choosing. She may ask anything of you and you cannot refuse it. And the great god of the sky thought she's married to me. There's nothing she could possibly want. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it in. And anyway, I've got the willpower. I'm a man. Then have willpower. <laughs> so he took the wine, bid the witch farewell, and shot into the sky. And as he was racing towards his heavenly kingdom, he thought, oh, I could just open the cork. It won't do any harm, will it? Just a smell. And as he did, those heavenly nectar and ambrosias <coughs> sped to his nostrils. And he breathed them in deep. And it was like nothing he had ever smelled. And he thought, just a sip. Oh, I'll be fine. Just a sip, just a sip. And he took just a sip. And as he took that sip, he could not stop himself. He drank and drank, and he drained the entire bottle dry. And he wept. He knew he would never taste anything so sweet again. The great god of the sky's wife, the goddess of kindness, did ask for a boon. Amazingly, there 
was <laughs> The next morning, she awoke to the sunrise. But she did not watch it herself, rather through the eyes of her lover. She was in the northmost mountains, and in bed with our wind. The two of them kissed, and now, the six months of the year, every year, the great god of the sky would have to allow his wife to go to her, and she could spend her time between the two she loved more than anything in the universe. And that, my friend, said the star, brings an end to our tale of the wind. And our girl said, she sounds fantastic. <laughs> and the star replied, I suppose um, in many ways you could suggest that what she does is a work of fantasy, but it's real, I assure you. So our girl said, you are very literal, star. <laughs> and our star said, well, you're very confusing. <clears throat> and they carried on. And they came over the last hill they needed to move over. But they were met with a sight they did not expect. Instead of vineyards, there were tents, rows upon rows upon rows. And in the distance, people streaming towards them. The waterfalls were still flowing, but there were no grapes to be grown. There was no space. They made their way towards the staircase, and it wound round and round past the murmuring waterfalls, which seemed to whisper with excitement at the sea. They came to the witch's door and they knocked three times. And the door of its own volition opened itself. And there was the witch, as you know, pretty cool. <laughs> she looked at the girl and the star, and the girl and the star looked at her. The girl and the star, the witch spoke. Her voice laced with honey and sweet spices, unlike anything our girl had ever heard. Thank you for coming. You come in dark times indeed. I am powerless to do anything. My magic may make safe haven for those who come to me, but soon they will be pursued. And I will do my best by everyone I can. But I cannot solve this problem, only you. You must unite the dragons. And together, with them, all of them, they must bring fire back into the sun. And if they do that, she might just have the strength to shine so bright that the cloud will be burnt from the sky. And all can return to as it was. But that will not be easy. The girl looked at the witch and said, why? And the witch said, the dragons have been divided for a very long time. And as she began her story, the walls of the castle began to fade, and so did the ceiling. And the girl and the star were transported to a time long, long before, a time where there were just 12 dragons. There, the witch began her tale. In the beginning of the dragons, there were but twelve. <coughs> the purple dragons of the north and the green dragons of the south. Six in each family. <coughs> but they hated each other. And instead of flying around the world together, rather they kept to their boundaries. In the middle, of the world there was a great divide and they would not pass it. Nobody knew why. There were stories that told as such but they were so lost in their telling no one believed them to be true. But they formed truths of their own and so the green and the purple dragons hated each other ever on. It was thought that they were immortal, so perhaps it could have lasted forever. But it will not surprise you that love changed things. A green dragon named Emerald.
fell in love with a purple dragon named Peter. The two courted at night, out of sight and underneath those shimmering stars and the silver pale moon who smiled down. They would hold hands and let their wings take them lazily in circles up and down, not even speaking. They didn't need to. They would lie next to each other and hope of a better world. And one day they decided they would hide their love no longer. And so they waited until the sun rose. And as she rose, she greeted them with a grin and they smiled back at her. But they had been seen. The purple dragons of the north and the green of the south descended upon them. With great wings, they obscured the sky. Furious voices hurled themselves across that divide. A tumult built and built and built into a storm that must break into a battle. Fire flickered beneath their tongues, smoke poured from their nostrils, and a fight that day would put their immortality to the test. In fact, a fight between creatures so strong would have ended the very world. But just as it seemed such would pass, Indigo and Emerald kissed. And as they kissed, the goddess of kindness and love put tenderness and softness into the hearts of all. And they stopped. And they started to talk. And the talking led to laughter. And soon they forgot why they had ever formed in the first place. They were united by the love of Emerald and and no longer did they keep to the north and south, no, they flew around and round the world. And they spoke kindly to the moon and whispered softly to the sun. And nobody thought it possible that Emerald and Indigo had two children. They were called after their muddy red colours, clay and coral. And they loved each other so much. Clay was full of life and play and fun. And Coral loved to sing and sang to all, all of the time. And all was very well. Until the day that Coral was shot down by a giant. And in turn was saved by a giant. Then his name was Angus McCage. He was a sweet and kind giant but best known for being very clumsy. The two of them fell in love very quickly, and they also liked to sit underneath the stars. And Angus would tell Coral of how once he had been so lonely he wished for wings so he could fly away. And Coral would sing to him softly. The two were so happy. But their union could not go hidden either. And when it was found out, Emerald and the green dragons were supported, <coughs> but the purple dragons and indigo were living. The idea of a dragon and a giant was unthinkable, nay, it was abhorrent, disgusting. And so, once more, they met at the Great Divide. Indigo and the purple dragons <coughs> told Coral that they must leave Angus. And Angus could not do that. Coral loved that. Emerald and the green dragon said, Come and live with us happily. But Coral could not watch their family go. And so Coral remained fixed. As green and purple alike went north and south, further and further away. And as Coral's heart tried to keep it together, it broke and it shattered into a thousand and one pieces and coral fell down to the cold earth where angus was waiting they embraced and in their final moments they whispered words to each other coral passed a bottle to angus it murmured and hummed with a song the cold once sung Angus became clumsy no longer and took himself to the tallest mountains in the tallest lands 
where he would become known as the Sad Giant. And the only thread of my tail which is left unstitched is that of Clay. Clay was devastated at the loss of their city <coughs> and did not know what to do. And so they went to the Great Lakes, not far from Angus himself. You've been that way before. As the story began to finish, the walls of the castle rose up again, and ceiling was back, and the girl and the star were facing the ship. Clay is the one you must find, she said. If you can find Clay, Clay can call a meeting of the dragons. And if you can convince them to unify, they may breathe fire into the sun, as you already know. But how do you do that? I don't know. What I can give you is kingdom. For you see, a single ember in the ashes of a fire can relight the blaze if kindling is brought. Click their fingers. Our girl had a bottle of wine. If, Carl, if indigo and emeralds both give each other a glass, warmth will come back to their hearts. Share it amongst the other dragons, and they too will feel that love, and you will have your chance to save the sun and save the world. But how to make them drink, I cannot tell. The star felt the bottle next to his chest, and our girl said to the witch, a raindrop once formed an ocean, we will find a way. The witch smiled at her and gave her a hug. Your journey is not easy. Go well with all the luck and love in the world. My magic will do all it can to keep people at bay, but it will not last long. And so, the girl and the star steeled themselves. Our girl smiled and the star shined. And they took themselves back down those winding steps. And they began to make their way west once more. The star knew the way to the western lands. And as they went, those rivers had become flooded. And flooded into meadows that should have been, to bloom, been in bloom. And the only refuge were hills. It was not an easy journey. It seemed that all was coming to an end. But they did find a place on an island in the greatest lake in those great lakes. And when our girl saw Clay, she looked at Clay's sad yellow eyes and Clay's muddy red colour. And before Clay could even speak, our girl told the stories, the stories that you have all heard. And then when she had finished, she threw her arms around Clay's great neck and said, I'm so sorry. I am sorry for all you have lost and all you have been through, and I have no words of comfort. But please help us. And Clay looked back at our girl and said, I have met someone like you before. She saved my life in many ways, and to honour her memory, I will help you. We have not much time. One full day until the next sunrise, and if that does not work, I do not think we should succeed. And so, Clay took the girl onto his back and began to beat wings towards the Great Divide. And as Clay flew, they sung a song. They hummed and it moved throughout the vibrations of the earth and it called the dragons. Purple dragons of the north Green dragons of the south began to come towards the Great Divide for the first time in eight. Indigo spoke first. Why have you brought us here, Clay? And Clay told the tales you have heard. This is our chance, they said. Our chance to put right what was wrong, to honour our coral's memory. Let us save the world. That Indigo and the purple dragon scoffed. We're immortal. This is not our fight. We will live no matter what. 
Emerald and the Green Dragons pledged to help, but Clay explained it must be all of them. And when nothing seemed right, Clay drifted down to where our girl and the star waited and said, It is not gone well. I cannot do this. Not again. And off Clay flew into the distance. And as Clay became smaller and smaller and a dot on the horizon, that tumult rose again into a storm that would break with a flash. Perhaps there would be a fight. The world would end a day early. Don't stop. I just agreed to fly home. So off they went, purple north, green sun. And as they were leaving, the star realized its moment. It opened a bottle and sang a song which went a little bit like this.
where did you get that star? And our star was struck, still caught in the moment. So our girl spoke for it. From the sad giant, she said. And he got it from your coral, and his coral too. The last he could ever hear of their voice. And instead of listening to it, he waited. For he thought and guessed it might be for something greater than him. And so the last moment of memory he could have of coral, he gave to the star, who sung it for you now. So you might see that their love is no different from your own. Emerald looked at Indigo and said, was our love wrong? And Indigo replied, no, I was. Some of that warmth filtered into their hearts. And our girl seized the moment and produced two cups of wine and explained how Indigo must give to Emerald and Emerald to Indigo. And when they did that warmth increased, and then it was shared among the dragons, and they were there. They were ready. So together, they agreed to help. They were going to save the world. And so, our girl leapt on the Emerald's back and the star to Indigo. And they flew to the eastern edge of the world where there is a waterfall which cascades down and it is the first thing the sun sees as she rises. And together, the dragons breathed fire into the sun. And she felt their warmth and she tried and she tried. But it was not enough. She did not shine brightly. to the other edge of the world we must and so they sped to the west and the same they tried again as the sun set and she was so grateful but still we our girl repeated to herself one last time one last time we must try and so from the west to the east they flew and as they did the cloud saw its moment had come if a cloud could smile it gathered itself as if ready for a great battle. Armies had stopped fighting and had now pursued those who sought peace. And they were a day's walk away from the northmost mountains. From our, our castle, the witch could see them. She would not have power to stop that storm. And the pale man was in his wings, watching all of this, moving still in his hand, smiling. Why he did what he did, I do not know. Perhaps he was someone who simply could not understand love and sought to destroy it. Perhaps he was someone who was so greedy, he wanted what no one else could have, no matter what the cost. Or perhaps he acted without reason, I do not know. But he did, and he smiled his crooked smile. And as the dragons flew, it looked as if nothing was going to work. They breathed fire into the sun once more, but it was the same. But then, from nowhere, appeared clay. And clay blew a great pink cloud of fire into the sun. And the dragons all at once together did just that. And the sun felt their warmth and their love, and she burned bright. And as she burned bright, she felt strength like no other. Strength of friendship and love coursed through. And she turned to the skies and said, Children, my stars, gather with me now. Your father, my moon, is missing, and we must find him. And so they formed themselves, and the cloud formed itself. An army was ready to commit slaughter, and the pale man grinned. But there was. No fight, no army, and the pale man was confused, because all there was was a flash of bright white light. And then, the climb was gone, and 
our pale man's wings were gone too. He had never been so exposed. So he gathered his things and made good to run away, but ran straight into a woman who seemed to be made purely of love. She was the sun in human form. And behind her was our girl, trying to take on her back, the star and the dragons. The sun stretched out her hand to ask for her moon. And the man, I do not know what he hoped to achieve, but he left it, ran away as fast as he could. But before he could get very far, he was tricked by our girl's trusty training stick. The star shined and she smiled. The moon she caught in her hand, and she handed it back to the sun who thanked her. And there was a murmur and a whisper, and then the moon stood as a man too, silver and smiling. And him and sun kissed. They turned to our girl with the star and they said thank you. And our girl asked what would become of the pale man. And the sun said, he has known only pain and hurt his whole life. Now he will see joy. He will become the dawn and will rise with me and bring smiles to all who see it. And so it was. The sun turned to her moon and said, come my love. This night can go on a little longer. And so they sped to the sky. And the great god of the sky cast his dark blanket so none could witness their embrace. And then the dragons bid their farewell. What was broken would not always be fixed, but they had at least honoured the memory of their coral. And now we fly together again. And then from nowhere appeared our witch the goddess of kindness and love, and the great god of the sky, he spoke. I shall never allow such things to pass again. The goddess of, the sky, of kindness and love smiled at him and held the hand of her lover, the witch, and they spoke together. Thank you. The witch looked at the girl and said, the ember has restarted at mine. And our girl smiled back, a rainbow has fallen over. And our girl and the star began to make their way home. The star told its siblings when it reached that point how to shoot and how to fly and how to find your place in the world. But before that, the girl and it had a conversation. The star had said, I don't think I found my place. I don't know where that is. Maybe, maybe it's everywhere. I can go wherever I want, and I fit just fine. Right. And the girl smiled, and the star shined. And the star said to the girl, but you, you didn't need someone. You know, in that way that I totally understand. <laughs> and the girl looked back at the star and said, no, I don't think I need to, need to. It was a pretty fun adventure, all the same. And the star shined, and she smiled. They hugged and did farewell. And our girl came back to her mother <coughs> and told her tale. And her mother made them cups of tea. <laughs> the next morning, the next morning there was a sunrise. Unlike any sunrise seen before. You see, before this, the sun just rose and set without colour. Now, with the dragon's love, the sun rose with pinks and oranges and purples and sets were just as spectacular. But that sunrise was the most spectacular of them all. People who were fighting put down their weapons and just looked. For how could you not look at something so wonderful? And they talked and they forgot about why they were fighting. And the sun's rays came last to the tallest mountains in the tallest lands, where they met sad giant. And as he saw them, something happened that happened, happened in an age. It started in the corners of his mouth and began to spread. A smile spread itself across his cheeks and that went into his body and was a laugh, which echoed through the peaks and echoed down into the world below. And 
he said to himself, she did it. An ember in the ashes restarted a fire. A raindrop formed an ocean. A little girl made the sad world happy. And he could not stop laughing. And then, he heard something he did not expect. not heard in such a long time, as if some, just for him, there was a song. Please give us a hug on the way out. It was such a treat. Just thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Woo!